Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, the only podcast bringing to life classic Catholic works through professional, high-quality audiobook recordings. Stay up to date with our latest podcast releases by signing up for our newsletter at catholicculture.org slash get audio. Today's reading, Duties of the Church Towards Knowledge, from the Idea of a University, by St. John Henry Newman, narrated by James T. Majewski. I have to congratulate myself, gentlemen, that at length I have accomplished, with whatever success, the difficult and anxious undertaking to which I have been immediately addressing myself. Difficult and anxious it has been, in truth, though the main subject of university teaching has been so often and so ably discussed already. For I have attempted to follow out a line of thought more familiar to Protestants just now than to Catholics, upon Catholic grounds. I declared my intention, when I opened the subject, of treating it as a philosophical and practical rather than as a theological question, with an appeal to common sense, not to ecclesiastical rules. And for this very reason, while my argument has been less ambitious, it has been deprived of the lights and supports which another mode of handling it would have secured. No anxiety, no effort of mind is more severe than his who, in a difficult matter, has it seriously at heart to investigate without error and to instruct without obscurity. As to myself, if the past discussion has at any time tried the patience of the kind persons who have given it their attention, I can assure them that on no one can it have inflicted so great labor and fatigue as on myself. Happy they who are engaged in provinces of thought so familiarly traversed and so thoroughly explored that they see everywhere the footprints, the paths, the landmarks, and the remains of former travelers, and can never step wrong. But for myself, gentlemen, I have felt like a navigator on a strange sea, who is out of sight of land, is surprised by night, and has to trust mainly to the rules and instruments of his science for reaching the port. The everlasting mountains, the high majestic cliffs of the opposite coast, radiant in the sunlight, which are our ordinary guides, fail us in an excursion such as this. The lessons of antiquity, the determinations of authority, are here rather the needle, chart, and plummet, than great objects with distinct and continuous outlines and completed details, which stand up and confront and occupy our gaze and relieve us from the tension and suspense of our personal observation. And thus, in spite of the pains we may take to consult others and avoid mistakes, it is not till the morning comes and the shore greets us and we see our vessel making straight for harbor that we relax our jealous watch and consider anxiety irrational. Such, in a measure, has been my feeling in the foregoing inquiry, in which, indeed, I have been in want neither of authoritative principles nor distinct precedents, but of treatises in extenso on the subject on which I have written, the finished work of writers who, by their acknowledged judgment and erudition, might furnish me for my private guidance with a running instruction on each point which successively came under review. I have spoken of the arduousness of my immediate undertaking because what I have been attempting has been of a preliminary nature, not contemplating the duties of the Church towards a university, nor the characteristics of a university which is Catholic, but inquiring what a university is, what is its aim, what its nature, what its bearings. I have accordingly laid down first that all branches of knowledge are, at least implicitly, the subject matter of its teaching that these branches are not isolated and independent one of another, but form together a whole or system, that they run into each other and complete each other, and that, in proportion to our view of them as a whole, is the exactness and trustworthiness of the knowledge which they separately convey, that the process of imparting knowledge to the intellect in this philosophical way is its true culture, that such culture is a good in itself, that the knowledge which is both its instrument and result is called liberal knowledge, that such culture, together with the knowledge which affects it, may fitly be sought for its own sake, that it is, however, in addition, of great secular utility, as constituting the best and highest formation of the intellect for social and political life, and lastly, that considered in a religious aspect, it concurs with Christianity a certain way, and then diverges from it, and consequently proves in the event, sometimes its serviceable ally, sometimes from its very resemblance to it, an insidious and dangerous foe. Though, however, these discourses have only professed to be preliminary, 
being directed to the investigation of the object and nature of the education which a university professes to impart, at the same time I do not like to conclude without making some remarks upon the duties of the church towards it, or rather on the ground of those duties. If the Catholic faith is true, a university cannot exist externally to the Catholic pale, for it cannot teach universal knowledge if it does not teach Catholic theology. This is certain. But still, though it had ever so many theological chairs, that would not suffice to make it a Catholic university. For theology would be included in its teaching only as a branch of knowledge, only as one out of many constituent portions, however important a one, of what I have called philosophy. Hence, a direct and active jurisdiction of the church over it and in it is necessary lest it should become the rival of the church with the community at large in those theological matters which to the church are exclusively committed, acting as the representative of the intellect as the church is the representative of the religious principle. The illustration of this proposition shall be the subject of my concluding discourse. I say then, that even though the case could be so that the whole system of Catholicism was recognized and professed, Without the direct presence of the Church, still this would not at once make such a university a Catholic institution, nor be sufficient to secure the due weight of religious considerations in its philosophical studies. For it may easily happen that a particular bias or drift may characterize an institution, which no rules can reach, nor officers remedy, nor professions or promises counteract. We have an instance of such a case in the Spanish Inquisition. Here was a purely Catholic establishment, devoted to the maintenance, or rather the ascendancy of Catholicism, keenly zealous for theological truth, the stern foe of every anti-Catholic idea, and administered by Catholic theologians, yet in no proper sense belonged to the Church. It was simply and entirely a state institution. It was an expression of that very Church and King's spirit which has prevailed in these islands, Nay, it was an instrument of the state, according to the confession of the acutest Protestant historians, in its warfare against the Holy See. Considered materially, it was nothing but Catholic, but its spirit and form were earthly and secular, in spite of whatever faith and zeal and sanctity and charity were to be found in the individuals who from time to time had a share in its administration. And in like manner, it is no sufficient security for the Catholicity of a university even that the whole of Catholic theology should be professed in it, unless the Church breathes her own pure and unearthly spirit into it, and fashions and molds its organization, and watches over its teaching, and knits together its pupils, and superintends its action. The Spanish Inquisition came into collision with the supreme Catholic authority, and that from the fact that its immediate end was of a secular character. And for the same reason, whereas academical institutions, as I have been so long engaged in showing, are in their very nature directed to social, national, temporal objects in the first instance, and since they are living and energizing bodies if they deserve the name of university at all, and of necessity have some one formal and definite ethical character, good or bad, and do of a certainty imprint that character on the individuals who direct and who frequent them, it cannot but be that, if left to themselves, they will, in spite of their profession of Catholic truth, work out results more or less prejudicial to its interests. Nor is this all. Such institutions may become hostile to revealed truth, in consequence of the circumstances of their teaching as well as of their end. They are employed in the pursuit of liberal knowledge, and liberal knowledge has a special tendency, not necessary or rightful, but a tendency, in fact, when cultivated by beings such as we are, to impress us with a mere philosophical theory of life and conduct in the place of revelation. I have said much of this subject already. Truth has two attributes, beauty and power. And while useful knowledge is the possession of truth as powerful, liberal knowledge is the apprehension of it as beautiful. Pursue it, either as beauty or as power, to its furthest extent and its true limit, and you are led by either road to the eternal and infinite, to the intimations of conscience and the announcements of the Church. Satisfy yourself with what is only visibly or intelligibly excellent as you are likely to do, and you will make present utility and natural beauty the practical test of truth, 
and the sufficient object of the intellect. It is not that you will at once reject Catholicism, but you will measure and proportion it by an earthly standard. You will throw its highest and most momentous disclosures into the background. You will deny its principles, explain away its doctrines, rearrange its precepts, and make light of its practices, even while you profess it. Knowledge, viewed as knowledge, exerts a subtle influence in throwing us back on ourselves and making us our own center and our minds the measure of all things. This, then, is the tendency of that liberal education of which a university is the school, namely, to view revealed religion from an aspect of its own, to fuse and recast it, to tune it, as it were, to a different key and reset its harmonies, to circumscribe it by a circle which unwarrantably amputates here and unduly develops there, and all under the notion, conscious or unconscious, that the human intellect, self-educated and self-supported, is more true and perfect in its ideas and judgments than that of prophets and apostles to whom the sights and sounds of heaven were immediately conveyed. A sense of propriety, order, consistency, and completeness gives birth to a rebellious stirring against miracle and mystery, against the severe and the terrible. This intellectualism, first and chiefly, comes into collision with precept, then with doctrine, then with the very principle of dogmatism. A perception of the beautiful becomes the substitute for faith. In a country which does not profess the faith, it at once runs, if allowed, into skepticism or infidelity. But even within the pale of the church, and with the most unqualified profession of her creed, it acts, if left to itself, as an element of corruption and debility. Catholicism, as it has come down to us from the first, seems to be mean and illiberal. It is a mere popular religion. It is the religion of illiterate ages or servile populations or barbarian warriors. It must be treated with discrimination and delicacy, corrected, softened, improved, if it is to satisfy an enlightened generation. It must be stereotyped as the patron of arts, or the pupil of speculation, or the protege of science. It must play the literary academician, or the empirical philanthropist, or the political partisan. It must keep up with the age. Some or other expedient it must devise in order to explain away or to hide tenets under which the intellect labors and of which it is ashamed. Its doctrine, for instance, of grace, its mystery of the Godhead, its preaching of the cross, its devotion to the queen of saints, or its loyalty to the apostolic see. Let this spirit be freely evolved out of that philosophical condition of mind, which in former discourses I have so highly, so justly extolled, and it is impossible, but first indifference, then laxity of belief, then even heresy will be the successive results. Here, then, are two injuries which revelation is likely to sustain at the hands of the master of human reason, unless the church, as in duty bound, protects the sacred treasure which is in jeopardy. The first is a simple ignoring of theological truth altogether, under the pretense of not recognizing differences of religious opinion, which will only take place in countries or under governments which have abjured Catholicism. The second, which is of a more subtle character, is a recognition indeed of Catholicism, but, as if in pretended mercy to it, an adulteration of its spirit. I will now proceed to describe the dangers I speak of more distinctly, by a reference to the general subject matter of instruction which a university undertakes. There are three great subjects on which human reason employs itself. God, nature, and man. And theology being put aside in the present argument, the physical and social worlds remain. These, when respectively subjected to human reason, form two books. The book of nature is called science, the book of man is called literature. Literature and science, thus considered, nearly constitute the subject matter of liberal education. And while science is made to subserve the former of the two injuries which revealed truth sustains, its exclusion, literature subserves the latter, its corruption. Let us consider the influence of each upon religion separately. As to physical science, of course, there can be no real collision between it and Catholicism. Nature and grace, 
reason and revelation, come from the same divine author, whose works cannot contradict each other. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied that, in matter of fact, there always has been a sort of jealousy and hostility between religion and physical philosophers. The name of Galileo reminds us of it at once. Not content with investigating and reasoning in his own province, it is said, he went out of his way directly to insult the received interpretation of Scripture. Theologians repelled an attack which was wanton and arrogant, and science, affronted in her minister, has taken its full revenge upon theology since. A vast multitude of its teachers, I fear it must be said, have been either unbelievers or skeptics, or at least have denied to Christianity any teaching distinctive or special over the religion of nature. There have indeed been most illustrious exceptions, some men protected by their greatness of mind, some by their religious profession, some by the fear of public opinion. But I suppose the run of experimentalists external to the Catholic Church have more or less inherited the positive or negative unbelief of Laplace, Buffon, Franklin, Priestley, Cuvier, and Humboldt. I do not, of course, mean to say that there need be in every case a resentful and virulent opposition made to religion on the part of scientific men, but their emphatic silence or phlegmatic inadvertence as to its claims have implied, more eloquently than any words, that in their opinion it had no voice at all in the subject matter which they had appropriated to themselves. The same antagonism shows itself in the Middle Ages. Friar Bacon was popularly regarded with suspicion as a dealer in unlawful arts, Pope Sylvester II has been accused of magic for his knowledge of natural secrets, and the geographical ideas of St. Virgil, Bishop of Salzburg, were regarded with anxiety by the great St. Boniface, the glory of England, the martyr apostle of Germany. I suppose, in matter of fact, magical superstition and physical knowledge did commonly go together in those ages. However, the hostility between experimental science and theology is far older than Christianity. Lord Bacon traces it to an era prior to Socrates. He tells us that, among the Greeks, the atheistic was the philosophy most favorable to physical discoveries, and he does not hesitate to imply that the rise of the religious schools was the ruin of science. Now, if we would investigate the reason of this opposition between theology and physics, I suppose we must first take into account Lord Bacon's own explanation of it. It is common in judicial inquiries to caution the parties on whom the verdict depends to put out of their minds whatever they have heard out of court on the subject to which their attention is to be directed. They are to judge by the evidence, and this is a rule which holds in other investigations as far as this, that nothing of an adventitious nature ought to be introduced into the process. In like manner, from religious investigations as such, physics must be excluded, and from physical as such, religion and if we mix them, we shall spoil both. The theologian speaking of divine omnipotence for the time simply ignores the laws of nature as existing restraints upon its exercise, and the physical philosopher, on the other hand, in his experiments upon natural phenomena, is simply ascertaining those laws, putting aside the question of that omnipotence. If the theologian, in tracing the ways of providence, were stopped with objections grounded on the impossibility of physical miracles, he would justly protest against the interruption, and were the philosopher, who was determining the motion of the heavenly bodies, to be questioned about their final or their first cause, he too would suffer an illogical interruption. The latter asks the cause of volcanoes, and is impatient at being told it is the divine vengeance. The former asks the cause of the overthrow of the guilty cities, and is preposterously referred to the volcanic action still visible in their neighborhood. The inquiry into final causes for the moment passes over the existence of established laws. The inquiry into physical passes over for the moment the existence of God. In other words, physical science is in a certain sense atheistic for the very reason it is not theology. This is Lord Bacon's justification, and an intelligible one, for considering that the fall of atheistic philosophy in ancient times was a blight upon the hopes of physical science. Aristotle, he says, Galen and others frequently introduce such causes as these. The hairs of the eyelids are for offense to the sight, the bones for pillars whence to build the bodies of animals, the leaves of trees are to defend the fruit from the sun and wind, the clouds are designed for watering the earth, all which are properly alleged in metaphysics, but in physics are impertinent and as remoras to the ship, 
that hinder the sciences from holding on their course of improvement and is introducing a neglect of searching after physical causes. Here, then, is one reason for the prejudice of physical philosophers against theology. On the one hand, their deep satisfaction in the laws of nature indisposes them towards the thought of a moral governor and makes them skeptical of his interposition. On the other hand, the occasional interference of religious criticism in a province not religious has made them sore, suspicious, and resentful. Another reason of a kindred nature is to be found in the difference of method by which truths are gained in theology and in physical science. Induction is the instrument of physics, and deduction only is the instrument of theology. There, the simple question is, what is revealed? All doctrinal knowledge flows from one fountainhead. If we are able to enlarge our view and multiply our propositions, it must be merely by the comparison and adjustment of the original truths. If we would solve new questions, it must be by consulting old answers. The notion of doctrinal knowledge absolutely novel and of simple addition from without is intolerable to Catholic ears and never was entertained by any one who was even approaching to an understanding of our creed. Revelation is all in all in doctrine, the apostles its sole depository, the inferential method its sole instrument, and ecclesiastical authority its sole sanction. The divine voice has spoken once for all, and the only question is about its meaning. Now this process, as far as it was reasoning, was the very mode of reasoning which, as regards physical knowledge, the school of Bacon has superseded by the inductive method. No wonder, then, that that school should be irritated and indignant to find that a subject matter remains still in which their favorite instrument has no office. No wonder that they rise up against this memorial of an antiquated system as an eyesore and an insult, and no wonder that the very force and dazzling success of their own method in its own departments should sway or bias unduly the religious sentiments of any persons who come under its influence. They assert that no new truth can be gained by deduction. Catholics assent, but add that, as regards religious truth, they have not to seek at all, for they have it already. Christian truth is purely of revelation. That revelation we can but explain, we cannot increase, except relatively to our own apprehensions. Without it, we should have known nothing of its contents. With it, we know just as much as its contents, and nothing more. And as it was given by a divine act independent of man, so will it remain in spite of man. Niebuhr may revolutionize history, Lavoisier chemistry, Newton astronomy, but God himself is the author as well as the subject of theology. When truth can change, its revelation can change. When human reason can outreason the omniscient, then may it supersede his work. Avowals such as these fall strange upon the ear of men whose first principle is the search after truth and whose starting points of search are things material and sensible. They scorn any process of inquiry not founded on experiment. The mathematics indeed they endure because that science deals with ideas, not with facts, and leads to conclusions hypothetical rather than real. Metaphysics they even use as a byword or reproach and ethics they admit only on condition that it gives up conscience as its scientific ground and bases itself on tangible utility. But as to theology, they cannot deal with it, they cannot master it, and so they simply outlaw it and ignore it. Catholicism, forsooth, confines the intellect, because it holds that God's intellect is greater than theirs, and that what he has done man cannot improve." and what in some sort justifies them to themselves in this extravagance is the circumstance that there is a religion close at their doors which, discarding so severe a tone, has actually adopted their own principle of inquiry. Protestantism treats scripture just as they deal with nature. It takes the sacred text as a large collection of phenomena from which, by an inductive process, each individual Christian may arrive at just those religious conclusions which approve themselves to his own judgment. It considers faith a mere modification of reason, as being an acquiescence in certain probable conclusions till better are found. Sympathy, then, if no other reason, 
throws experimental philosophers into alliance with the enemies of Catholicism. I have another consideration to add, not less important than any I have hitherto adduced. The physical sciences, astronomy, chemistry, and the rest are doubtless engaged upon divine works and cannot issue in untrue religious conclusions. But at the same time it must be recollected that revelation has reference to circumstances which did not arise till after the heavens and the earth were made. They were made before the introduction of moral evil into the world. Whereas the Catholic Church is the instrument of a remedial dispensation to meet that introduction. No wonder, then, that her teaching is simply distinct, though not divergent, from the theology which physical science suggests to its followers. She sets before us a number of attributes and acts on the part of the divine being for which the material and animal creation gives no scope. Power, wisdom, goodness are the burden of the physical world, but it does not and could not speak of mercy, long-suffering, and the economy of human redemption, and but partially of the moral law and moral goodness. Sacred theology, says Lord Bacon, must be drawn from the words in the oracles of God, not from the light of nature or the dictates of reason. It is written that the heavens declare the glory of God, but we nowhere find it that the heavens declare the will of God, which is pronounced a law and a testimony that men should do according to it. Nor does this hold only in the great mysteries of the Godhead, of the creation, of the redemption. We cannot doubt that a large part of the moral law is too sublime to be attained by the light of nature, though it is still certain that men, even with the light and law of nature, have some notions of virtue, vice, justice, wrong, good, and evil. That the new and further manifestations of the Almighty made by revelation are in perfect harmony with the teaching of the natural world forms indeed one subject of the profound work of the Anglican Bishop Butler. But they cannot in any sense be gathered from nature, and the silence of nature concerning them may easily seduce the imagination, though it has no force to persuade the reason, to revolt from doctrines which have not been authenticated by facts, but are enforced by authority. In a scientific age, then, there will naturally be a parade of what is called natural theology, a widespread profession of the Unitarian creed, an impatience of mystery, and a skepticism about miracles. And to all this must be added the ample opportunity which physical science gives to the indulgence of those sentiments of beauty, order, and congruity, of which I have said so much, as the ensigns and colors, as they may be called, of a civilized age in its warfare against Catholicism. It being considered, then, that Catholicism differs from physical science in drift, in method of proof, and in subject matter, how can it fail to meet with unfair usage from the philosophers of any institution in which there is no one to take its part? That physical science itself will be ultimately the loser by such ill-treatment of theology, I have insisted on at great length in some preceding discourses. For to depress unduly... To encroach upon any science, and much more on an important one, is to do an injury to all. However, this is not the concern of the Church. The Church has no call to watch over and protect science. But towards theology she has a distinct duty. It is one of the special trusts committed to her keeping. Where theology is, there she must be. And if a university cannot fulfill its name and office without the recognition of revealed truth, she must be there to see that it is a bona fide recognition, sincerely made, and consistently acted on. And if the interposition of the Church is necessary in the schools of science, still more imperatively is it demanded in the other main constituent portion of the subject matter of liberal education, literature. Literature stands related to man as science stands to nature. It is his history. Man is composed of body and soul. He thinks and he acts. He has appetites, passions, affections, motives, designs. He has within him the lifelong struggle of duty with inclination. He has an intellect fertile and capacious. He is formed for society, and society multiplies and diversifies in endless combinations his personal characteristics, moral and intellectual. All this constitutes his life. Of all this, literature is the expression. 
so that literature is to man in some sort what autobiography is to the individual. It is his life and remains. Moreover, he is this sentient, intelligent, creative, and operative being quite independent of any extraordinary aid from heaven or any definite religious belief. And as such, as he is in himself, does literature represent him. It is the life and remains of the natural man, innocent or guilty. I do not mean to say that it is impossible in its very notion that literature should be tinctured by a religious spirit. Hebrew literature, as far as it can be called literature, certainly is simply theological and has a character imprinted on it which is above nature. But I am speaking of what is to be expected without any extraordinary dispensation. And I say that, in matter of fact, as science is the reflection of nature, so is literature also. The one of nature physical, the other of nature moral and social. Circumstances such as locality, period, language seem to make little or no difference in the character of literature as such. On the whole, all literatures are one. They are the voices of the natural man. I wish this were all that had to be said to the disadvantage of literature. But while nature physical remains fixed in its laws, nature moral and social has a will of its own, is self-governed, and never remains any long while in that state from which it started into action. Man will never continue in a mere state of innocence. He is sure to sin, and his literature will be the expression of his sin, and this whether he be heathen or Christian. Christianity has thrown gleams of light on him in his literature, but as it has not converted him, but only certain choice specimens of him, so it has not changed the characters of his mind or of his history. His literature is either what it was, or worse than what it was, in proportion as there has been an abuse of knowledge granted and a rejection of truth. On the whole, then, I think it will be found, and ever found, as a matter of course, that literature as such, no matter of what nation, is the science or history, partly and at best of the natural man, partly of man in rebellion. I wish this were all that had to be said to the disadvantage of literature. But while nature physical remains fixed in its laws, nature moral and social has a will of its own, is self-governed, and never remains any long while in that state from which it started into action. Man will never continue in a mere state of innocence. He is sure to sin, and his literature will be the expression of his sin, and this whether he be heathen or Christian. Christianity has thrown gleams of light on him in his literature, but as it has not converted him but only certain choice specimens of him, so it has not changed the characters of his mind or of his history. His literature is either what it was or worse than what it was in proportion as there has been an abuse of knowledge granted and a rejection of truth. On the whole, then, I think it will be found and ever found as a matter of course that literature as such, no matter of what nation, is the science or history, partly and at best, of the natural man, partly of man in rebellion. Here, then, I say, you are involved in a difficulty greater than that which besets the cultivation of science. For if physical science be dangerous, as I have said, it is dangerous because it necessarily ignores the idea of moral evil. But literature is open to the more grievous imputation of recognizing and understanding it too well. Someone will say to me, perhaps, Our youth shall not be corrupted. We will dispense with all general or national literature, whatever, if it be so exceptionable. We will have a Christian literature of our own, as pure, as true as the Jewish. You cannot have it. I do not say you cannot form a select literature for the young, nay, even for the middle or lower classes. This is another matter altogether. I am speaking of university education, which implies an extended range of reading, which has to deal with standard works of genius, or what are called the classics of a language. And I say, from the nature of the case, if literature is to be made a study of human nature, you cannot have a Christian literature. It is a contradiction in terms to attempt a sinless literature of sinful man. 
you may gather together something very great and high, something higher than any literature ever was, and when you have done so, you will find that it is not literature at all. You will have simply left the delineation of man as such, and have substituted for it, as far as you have had anything to substitute, that of man as he is or might be under certain special advantages. Give up the study of man as such, if so it must be, but say you do so. Do not say you are studying him, his history, his mind, and his heart, when you are studying something else. Man is a being of genius, passion, intellect, conscience, power. He exercises these various gifts in various ways, in great deeds, in great thoughts, in heroic acts, in hateful crimes. He founds states, he fights battles, he builds cities, he plows the forest, he subdues the elements, he rules his kind. He creates vast ideas and influences many generations. He takes a thousand shapes and undergoes a thousand fortunes. Literature records them all to the life. Quicud agunt homines, votum, timor, era, voluptas, gaudia, discursus. He pours out his fervid soul in poetry. He sways to and fro. He soars, he dives in his restless speculations. His lips drop eloquence. He touches the canvas and it glows with beauty. He sweeps the strings and they thrill with an ecstatic meaning. He looks back into himself and he reads his own thoughts and notes them down. He looks out into the universe and tells over and celebrates the elements and principles of which it is the product. Such is man. Put him aside, keep him before you, for whatever you do, do not take him for what he is not, for something more divine and sacred, for man regenerate. Nay, beware of showing God's grace and its work at such disadvantage as to make the few of whom it has thoroughly influenced compete in intellect with the vast multitude who either have it not or use it ill. The elect are few to choose out of, and the world is inexhaustible. From the first, Jabel and Tubal Cain, Nimrod the stout hunter, the learning of the pharaohs, and the wisdom of the east country are of the world. Every now and then they are rivaled by a Solomon or a Bezalel, but the habitat of natural gifts is the natural man. The church may use them. She cannot at her will originate them. Not till the whole human race is made new will its literature be pure and true. Possible, of course, it is an idea for nature, inspired by heavenly grace, to exhibit itself on a large scale in an originality of thought or action even far beyond what the world's literature has recorded or exemplified. But if you would in fact have a literature of saints, first of all, have a nation of them. What is a clearer proof of the truth of all this than the structure of the inspired word itself. It is undeniably not the reflection or picture of the many, but of the few. It is no picture of life, but an anticipation of death and judgment. Human literature is about all things, grave or gay, painful or pleasant, but the inspired word views them only in one aspect, and as they tend to one scope. It gives us little insight into the fertile developments of mind. It has no terms in its vocabulary to express with exactness the intellect and its separate faculties. It knows nothing of genius, fancy, wit, invention, presence of mind, resource. It does not discourse of empire, commerce, enterprise, learning, philosophy, or the fine arts. Slightly, too, does it touch on the more simple and innocent courses of nature and their reward— Little does it say of those temporal blessings which rest upon our worldly occupations and make them easy, of the blessings which we derive from the sunshine day and the serene night, from the succession of the seasons and the produce of the earth, little about our recreations and our daily domestic comforts, little about the ordinary occasions of festivity and mirth which sweeten human life, and nothing at all about various pursuits or amusements which it would be going too much into detail to mention. We read indeed of the feast when Isaac was weaned, and of Jacob's courtship, and of the religious merrymakings of holy Job. But exceptions such as these do but remind us what might be in Scripture and is not. If then by literature is meant the manifestation of human nature in human language, you will seek for it in vain except in the world. 
Put up with it as it is, or do not pretend to cultivate it. Take things as they are, not as you could wish them. Nay, I am obliged to go further still. Even if we could, still we should be shrinking from our plain duty, gentlemen, did we leave out literature from education. For why do we educate except to prepare for the world? Why do we cultivate the intellect of the many beyond the first elements of knowledge except for this world? Will it be much matter in the world to come whether our bodily health or whether our intellectual strength was more or less, except, of course, as this world is in all its circumstances a trial for the next? If, then, a university is a direct preparation for this world, let it be what it professes. It is not a convent. It is not a seminary. It is a place to fit men of the world for the world. We cannot possibly keep them from plunging into the world with all its ways and principles and maxims when their time comes, but we can prepare them against what is inevitable, and it is not the way to learn to swim in troubled waters never to have gone into them. Proscribe, I do not merely say particular authors, particular works, particular passages, but secular literature as such. Cut out from your class books all broad manifestations of the natural man, and those manifestations are waiting for your pupil's benefit at the very doors of your lecture room in living and breathing substance. They will meet him there in all the charm of novelty and all the fascination of genius or of amiableness. Today a pupil, tomorrow a member of the great world. Today confined to the lives of the saints, tomorrow thrown upon Babel thrown on Babel, without the honest indulgence of wit and humor and imagination having ever been permitted to him, without any fastidiousness of taste wrought into him, without any rule given him for discriminating the precious from the vile, beauty from sin, the truth from the sophistry of nature, what is innocent from what is poison. You have refused him the masters of human thought, who would in some sense have educated him because of their incidental corruption. You have shut up from him those whose thoughts strike home to our hearts, whose words are proverbs, whose names are indigenous to all the world, who are the standard of their mother tongue and the pride and boast of their countrymen, Homer, Ariosto, Cervantes, Shakespeare, because the old Adam smelt rank in them. And for what have you reserved him? You have given him a liberty unto the multitudinous blasphemy of his day. You have made him free of its newspapers, its reviews, its magazines, its novels, its controversial pamphlets, of its parliamentary debates, its law proceedings, its platform speeches, its songs, its drama, its theater, of its enveloping, stifling atmosphere of death. You have succeeded but in this, in making the world his university. Difficult, then, as the question may be, and much as it may try the judgments and even divide the opinions of zealous and religious Catholics, I cannot feel any doubt myself, gentlemen, that the Church's true policy is not to aim at the exclusion of literature from secular schools, but at her own admission into them. Let her do for literature in one way what she does for science in another. Each has its imperfection, and she has her remedy for each. She fears no knowledge, but she purifies all. She represses no element of our nature, but cultivates the whole. Science is grave, methodical, logical. With science, then, she argues and opposes reason to reason. Literature does not argue, but declaims and insinuates. It is multiform and versatile. It persuades instead of convincing. It seduces, it carries captive. It appeals to the sense of honor, or to the imagination, or to the stimulus of curiosity. It makes its way by means of gaiety, satire, romance, the beautiful, the pleasurable. Is it wonderful that with an agent like this, the church should claim to deal with a vigor corresponding to its restlessness? to interfere in its proceedings with a higher hand, and to wield an authority in the choice of its studies and of its books which would be tyrannical if reason and fact were the only instruments of its conclusions. But, anyhow, her principle is the one and the same throughout. 
not to prohibit truth of any kind, but to see that no doctrines pass under the name of truth but those which claim it rightfully. Such, at least, is the lesson which I am taught by all the thought which I have been able to bestow upon the subject. Such is the lesson which I have gained from the history of my own special father and patron, St. Philip Neri. He lived in an age as traitorous to the interests of Catholicism as any that preceded it or can follow it. He lived at a time when pride mounted high and the senses held rule, a time when kings and nobles never had more of state and homage and never less of personal responsibility and peril. When medieval winter was receding and the summer sun of civilization was bringing into leaf and flower a thousand forms of luxurious enjoyment, when a new world of thought and beauty had opened upon the human mind in the discovery of the treasures of classic literature and art, he saw the great and the gifted dazzled by the enchantress and drinking in the magic of her song. He saw the high and the wise, the student and the artist, painting and poetry and sculpture and music and architecture drawn within her range and circling round the abyss. He saw heathen farms mounting thence and forming in the thick air. All this he saw, and he perceived that the mischief was to be met not with argument, not with science, not with protests and warnings, not by the recluse or the preacher, but by means of the great counter-fascination of purity and truth. He was raised up to do a work almost peculiar in the church, not to be a Jerome Savonarola, though Philip had a true devotion towards him and a tender memory of his Florentine house, not to be a St. Charles, though in his beaming countenance Philip had recognized the aureole of the saint, not to be a St. Ignatius wrestling with the foe, though Philip was termed the society's bell of call, so many subjects did he send to it, not to be a St. Francis Xavier, though Philip had longed to shed his blood for Christ in India with him, not to be a St. Cajetan or hunter of souls, for Philip preferred, as he expressed it, tranquilly to cast in his net to gain them. He preferred to yield to the stream and direct the current which he could not stop of science, literature, art, and fashion, and to sweeten and to sanctify what God had made very good and man had spoiled. And so he contemplated as the idea of his mission, not the propagation of the faith, nor the exposition of doctrine, nor the catechetical schools. Whatever was exact and systematic pleased him not. He put from him monastic rule and authoritative speech, as David refused the armor of his king. No, he would be but an ordinary individual priest as others, and his weapons should be but unaffected humility and unpretending love. All he did was to be done by the light and fervor and convincing eloquence of his personal character and his easy conversation. He came to the Eternal City, and he sat himself down there, and his home and his family gradually grew up around him by the spontaneous accession of materials from without. He did not so much seek his own as draw them to him. He sat in his small room, and they in their gay worldly dresses, the rich and the well-born, as well as the simple and the illiterate, crowded into it. In the mid-heats of summer, in the frosts of winter, still was he in that low and narrow cell at San Girolamo, reading the hearts of those who came to him and curing their souls' maladies by the very touch of his hand. It was a vision of the Magi worshipping the infant Savior, so pure and innocent, so sweet and beautiful was he, and so loyal and so dear to the gracious Virgin Mother. And they who came remained gazing and listening, till at length first one and then another threw off their bravery and took his poor cassock and girdle instead. Or if they kept it, it was to put hair cloth under it, or to take on them a rule of life, while to the world they looked as before. In the words of his biographer, he was all things to all men, he suited himself to noble and ignoble, young and old, subjects and prelates, learned and ignorant, and received those who were strangers to him with singular benignity and embraced them with as much love and charity as if he had been a long while expecting them. When he was called upon to be merry, he was so. If there was a demand upon his sympathy, he was equally ready. 
He gave the same welcome to all, caressing the poor equally with the rich and wearying himself to assist all to the utmost limits of his power. In consequence of his being so accessible and willing to receive all comers, many went to him every day, and some continued for the space of thirty, nay forty years, to visit him very often both morning and evening, so that his room went by the agreeable nickname of the Home of Christian Mirth. Nay, people came to him not only from all parts of Italy, but from France, Spain, Germany, and all Christendom, and even the infidels and Jews who had ever any communication with him revered him as a holy man. The first families of Rome, the Massimi, the Adobrandini, the Colonias, the Altieri, the Viteleschi, were his friends and his penitents. Nobles of Poland, grandes of Spain, knights of Malta, could not leave Rome without coming to him. Cardinals, archbishops, and bishops were his intimates. Federico Borromeo haunted his room and got the name of Father Philip's soul. The cardinal archbishops of Verona and Bologna wrote books in his honor. Pope Pius IV died in his arms. Lawyers, painters, musicians, physicians, it was the same too with them. Baronius, Zazara, and Ricci left the law at his bidding and joined his congregation to do its work, to write the annals of the church, and to die in the odor of sanctity. Palestrina had Father Philip's ministrations in his last moments. Animucha hung about him during life, sent him a message after death, and was conducted by him through purgatory to heaven. And who was he, I say all the while, but a humble priest, a stranger in Rome, with no distinction of family or letters, no claim of station or of office, great simply in the attraction with which a divine power had gifted him. And yet, thus humble, thus unennobled, thus empty-handed, he has achieved the glorious title of Apostle of Rome. Well were it for his clients and children, gentlemen, if they could promise themselves the very shadow of his special power, or could hope to do a miserable fraction of the sort of work in which he was preeminently skilled. But so far at least they may attempt. To take his position, and to use his method, and to cultivate the arts of which he was so bright a pattern. For me, if it be God's blessed will that in the years now coming I am to have a share in the great undertaking which has been the occasion and the subject of these discourses, so far I can say for certain that, whether or not I can do anything at all in St. Philip's way, at least I can do nothing in any other. Neither by my habits of life nor by vigor of age am I fitted for the task of authority or of rule or of initiation. I do but aspire, if strength is given me, to be your minister in a work which must employ younger minds and stronger lives than mine. I am but fit to bear my witness, to proffer my suggestions, to express my sentiments as has in fact been my occupation in these discussions, to throw such light upon general questions, upon the choice of objects, upon the import of principles, upon the tendency of measures, as past reflection and experience enable me to contribute. I shall have to make appeals to your consideration, your friendliness, your confidence, of which I have had so many instances, on which I so tranquilly repose. And after all, neither you nor I must ever be surprised, should it so happen, that the hand of him, with whom are the springs of life and death, weighs heavy on me and makes me unequal to anticipations in which you have been too kind, and to hopes in which I may have been too sanguine. This has been Duties of the Church Towards Knowledge, from the Idea of University, by St. John Henry Newman, narrated by James T. Majewski, production copyright 2023 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is a production of CatholicCulture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Jim Papandrea, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective, and the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and more at CatholicCulture.org.